Welcome to One Minute to Midnight. I'm Wilfred Cunningham. The news shapes how we perceive the world and our place in it. It also informs the way we think. Anthropologists have repeatedly documented pre-literate societies and peoples sharing and requesting news with outsiders. Oral news has been shared since prehistory. There is evidence to suggest that the Egyptians, who are the first recorded to have used organized courier networks more than 4,000 years ago, distributed decrees and nationally important information through such networks. During the Roman Republic, actors, or acts, were produced to inform the public of various noteworthy events, the first of which appeared around 130 years before the birth of Christ. Usually created on stone or metal tableau, these actors often had news from frontiers, government appointments, and the outcomes of trials inscribed on them. They were perhaps one of the first instances of a public message board, and an early precursor to the modern newspaper. This form of spreading the news alongside criers, who would shout news and other articles of information in public places such as markets, was the mainstay of spreading information until the invention of the printing press, usually credited to Johannes Gutenberg in circa 1440. In the later part of the 15th century, printing enabled quick and cheap dissemination of information, as well as political and religious pamphleting and production of printed books. Although preceded by small news publications and booklets, usually focused on single events, the printing press and appetite for information culminated in the birth of the newspaper, the first of which was Relation à la Fernemun und Gedenkwedingen Historien, or in English, Collection of All Distinguished and Memorable News, which was published in Strasbourg in 1605. Previously, the type of message board news, comparable to that broadcast by Roman actors, had usually been concise, factual, and employed neutral language, with printed information that aimed to persuade, confined to pamphlets. Up until this time in England, since the emergence of the printing industry, distribution of news and printed information had been heavily controlled and censored by the government. But in 1641, a year before the nation was plunged into civil war, the Court of High Commission and the Star Chamber, a court closely tied to the King and often used to suppress opposition, were abolished by the Long Parliament, meaning that people in England suddenly became far less restricted in what they could print. With the Civil War came propaganda, with titles such as the Parliament Scout reporting stories with a distinct political bias, its articles often written in the hope of casting the parliamentarians in a positive light and the royalists in a negative one, going head to head with its political opposite, Mercurius Aeolicus. Of course, almost all printed information before this had been biased in some way. Even the actor-style bulletins were biased. They were from official sources and were at least somewhat biased due to their selective nature in choosing what to report. But the English Civil War is a good example of an early instance where publications would often directly contradict each other and were at least partly produced not to inform but persuade, in a manner that is not totally unlike the bias exercised by publications today. In 1704, Daniel Defoe printed The Storm, an account of a hurricane in Britain, which used witnesses' testimony and emotive language and has since been called the first substantial work of modern journalism. Around the same time, the printing industry began to grow in colonial America and was often politically biased. The War of Independence from 1775 to 1782 saw newspapers across America openly support either the Patriot or Loyalist causes. Patriot papers often inflating the numbers of British soldiers, while at the same time minimizing the numbers of revolutionary forces so as to make their victories greater, and British outlets skewing lost battles into heroic efforts by outnumbered stations. A little over a century after the USA won its independence, the term yellow journalism was coined to characterize the ruthless competition for domination of circulation between the New York world and the New York Journal. Yellow journalism is often credited as being responsible for the USA's entry into the Spanish-Cuban War. But such journalism was, at the time, largely confined to New York. But its sensationalist and often inaccurate practices have since prevailed and spread. In 1901 Britain, the tabloid appeared and has since spread across the globe and greatly varies in content and journalistic quality. However, usually features simplified, and some may argue oversimplified, content and often, like yellow journalism, sensationalist stories that frequently have more grounding in gossip than fact. 
Tabloid journalism, which is not a reference to the size of the newspaper, is often considered to be junk news. News about celebrities, or the private lives of public figures, opinion pieces presented as fact or unsupported by facts, stories designed to pique sexual interest, or content created with headlines designed to encourage readership, even if holding little relevance to its article. All of these things still exist. The oversimplified tabloid journalism, often combined with sensationalist yellow journalism, pieces that may be based on facts, but are deliberately presented in an emotive way, with the intention either of drawing people in or persuading the audience, and perhaps more purely, overt bias and propaganda. Biased or sensationalist news can contain important information and can appeal to people who wouldn't otherwise be engaged in dispassionate presentation of facts and can lead to constructive opposition to government or status quos. Speaking at the Leveson Inquiry, a UK government inquiry established to investigate phone hacking conducted by now shut down paper The News of the World, prominent legal figure Kenneth MacDonald argued, Obviously newspapers have to obey the law, but a noisy raucous press is good for democracy and so good for Britain. This is part of holding the state and powerful people to account. The risk of statutory regulation is that it may have a chilling effect. It may encourage deference. I don't think we want a deferential press any more than we want a censored press. In the US, the Fairness Doctrine required broadcasters to devote some of their airtime to divisive matters of public interest and to fairly represent opposing views. By the mid-1980s, many believed that technology had reached a point where many different media channels could coexist, meaning that there was less of a need for balance on a single channel. In 1985, the Federal Communications Commission released a report stating that the doctrine hurt the public interest and violated free speech rights guaranteed by the First Amendment. The doctrine was revoked in 1987. The revocation removed control from the press and paved the way for TV networks to become politicised and TV and radio stations to operate with overt political bias. Alongside political bias, particularly since the 1980s, there has been fear of corporate bias. In 1983, 90% of the United States media was operated by around 50 corporations. Today it is six. Often contradictory views are given about bias. The BBC is frequently cited by parties outside of the UK as having pro-British sentiments. But inside the UK, it has long been held by some, including elements of successive governments, that the corporation is biased against the government. We see bias and imbalance from our own prejudice. So we can have fun charting an exaggerated right-wing history of the BBC as easily as a left-wing one. For every boys from the black stuff, there was a Dallas glorifying capitalism a trooping of the colour and songs of praise, reasserting the permanence of old establishment ideals and bishoprics. While many outlets within these corporations may differ between each other in political stance and in their reporting style, making a clear bias difficult to establish, some criticise the concentration of ownership between so few and powerful entities and fear that news would be easy to censor, influence or create for any of them when owners and influencers within such organisations, such as Rupert Murdoch, are repeatedly connected to governments and senior members of opposition parties, it arguably creates a public distrust for their corporations. But as with the BBC example, bias can be difficult to establish, and the efficacy of their support is questionable, as too is the reality of it. I think good, strong news organisations can by disclosing things can help shape the agenda. In 2012, 77% of those surveyed in the Pew Research Center said the media tend to favor one side. PolitiFact is a website that checks the statements of politicians and news pundits and rates their truthfulness. Selected statements over the years have seen the website find pundits on the Fox network making totally accurate statements 10% of the time and 12% of the time on NBC with most ratings falling in the middle ground between being totally true and totally false. In the UK, a survey in 2010 showed that 64% of respondents then believed Sky News had a clear pro-conservative bias in its reporting. Other reports for other countries show that the public clearly believe that at least some media outlets are biased. With the rise of the internet, 
Ten or hundreds of thousands of news sources have been created, many with obvious political leanings. And Cass Sunstein, a well-known legal scholar, wrote in his book, Republic.com, that the internet creates echo chambers, where users surround themselves only with the like-minded, often unintentionally. Evgeny Morozov, a social and political writer, argues that the internet may have led to increased partisanship and has and will continue to balkanize. It seems indisputable that at least some of the media is biased, but perhaps some bias is inevitable, even if complete balance and fairness is attempted. News is still written by people, and people are perhaps often influenced by their own upbringings, their societies, their experiences, religions, and beliefs even if they attempt to suppress the influence of those factors. True objectivity might be unachievable, and while competing biases can make it difficult to ascertain the facts, their number and variety at least prevent an information status quo. Media bias is often reported and written about, and seems unavoidable in any political climate. Bias distorts truth, and it is most effective when it is unacknowledged, or hidden, or presented as neutral. Perhaps it's safe to say that you can never trust a single source. So, until next time, goodbye and try to remain calm.